So, hello everybody. Nice to see so many familiar faces here. So I'm Otto, and I believe many of you have seen me talking before. I've, this is the 14th WordCamp I'm attending, and I'm, a very, I'm the CEO for Seravo, and I'm a very technical CEO, and I've been involved in doing plugins and done some patches for WordPress core, and in fact, to most of the stack that we're using, because I'm a die-hard Linux and open source advocate. And I've spoken many times at WordCamps about this talk, WordPress Security 101. And in that talk, I tell what you should do, what you should focus on if you want to protect your site, and what are the unnecessary things you can ignore, because there's so, many, so much false security advice out there. And if you haven't seen that presentation before, I recommend you go and check it out. But today I'm not going to talk about how to protect your WordPress site. Today I'm going to talk about something different. I'm going to talk, talk to you about a Friday in November, what happened then, and hopefully you can learn something, maybe some technical techniques, but most of all, a mindset about what needs to be done when, despite all protections, somebody gets in and there's a security breach. So I'm from a company that does premium hosting and upkeep for WordPress. So that involves that we take care of security for our customers. And we do upkeep, which means that if the site goes down, we take it back up, and that covers also security incidents. So if, if, if you're our client and your site gets hacked despite our protections, then we will fix it for free, remove the malware and make it back online. So that's, that's, that's something we have uh, like two and a half thousand sites that we are upkeeping. So security incidents are rare. But since we have so many sites, we also have, they are regular, and we have lots of experience in, in investigating and cleaning up sites. And today I'm going to tell you about one Friday, which was slightly unusual. And it started like this. It was just an average Friday, no, no warning signs of anything, and then suddenly, at 11.37, one site started alerting that it doesn't work anymore. And then a few minutes later, another, and then immediately a third, and then two minutes later, a fourth one. So something very suspicious was going on. And it wasn't even that Friday 13th, just an average Friday. So we went to look what happened to the sites, and immediately noticed that it had, they had, all of the four sites had the same site URL. And this is not the real site URL for the, for the site. So we started wondering, what's going on? Is this a mistake by the customer or the customer's admin? Did they change this on purpose? And the interesting thing was that all of these four sites belonged to the same customer. They were all news sites and the same media conglomerate owned, owns them. So it was really weird that they all stopped working at the same time. And this was the symptom that you could immediately see. And we quickly figured out that that page doesn't exist or didn't work, and this doesn't make any sense, and it's not something the customer did. And then, since it was the same customer who owned all the sites, we immediately started suspecting some kind of targeted attack against that customer. But what happened on the site didn't make sense. We didn't understand how, why would somebody do a targeted attack like this to a customer. But definitely it was a security issue. Somebody had got in and done something weird. So the first person in our staff who noticed this and started investigating it, immediately realized that it's a security issue and then notified our security officer on call about that this needs attention. 
And the first, first technical thing done is that we saved the process list, what was going on at those customer sites, and then we shut them down temporarily so that no further damage would happen. Then we notified the customer that there's a security incident and we're investigating it. And then since it was four sites and we realized this is something unusual and big, we, the, it was escalated. So it was not just the security officer on call, but the three, three person team investigating all the sites in parallel. So by 11.55, the security investigation had started full speed. So these are the questions we ask when we start to investigate a security incident. First of all, what's happening? And is it still happening? What do we need to do to stop it? And what happened before this? What led to this situation? And when did it start? And is there, does the site currently have malicious code, some kind of backdoor or something hidden somewhere? And what has in general changed on the site right now and recently? Something in the files, something in the database. And what changes are valid, something that's supposed to change, and what is an anomaly, something potentially done by an intruder. And then, of course, who did it? Well, we don't see any names, and rarely the investigation leads to finding a real human suspect, but at least what we can do is find out the IP addresses and where the traffic, malicious traffic, is coming from. And then we can also figure out a few identifiers, kind of a fingerprints related to the attacker. And then after that, when you have the situation under control, you want to figure out how they got in, how they did it, and what kind of level of access the intruder got, what data could potentially have been leaked, leaked because then we know what to tell the customer about what, what is the maximum kind of damage that could have happened in this case. And then maybe try to figure out something about the motive. Was it a targeted attack? Was it just somebody trying to plant backdoors and sell them, sell them later in the black market? And, and in general, what damage was caused? So then the next steps in practice, what we did. And the steps I'm presenting here is kind of our standard steps, or at least the what, uh, last fall version of them. What we do, we constantly improve our, our process, what we do at security incidents. And this is almost our latest process at the moment. So the first thing to do is to make a backup. The backup stores the state the whole system was in at the onset of the security investigation. And then also when you have a fresh backup, it's easier to compare the fresh backup with the latest backup to see track down changes because sometimes the intruders try to mask their changes and modify file dates and stuff so it would be more difficult to find what happened. And with the backups, you can then compare the backups and we have a few custom tools built for that so that we get easy, quick, quickly a list of which files changed and then just using basic command line diff tools, you can compare two folders and all of the files in, in, in them to compare the, 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 like the backup, the previous backup and then the latest state. So this will reveal changes. And then after that, we check in, check who logged into the VP admin and who logged in using SSH and try to de detect if there was somebody some IP addresses or usernames that don't belong there. And then the next step is that we use this VPCLI commands, which are very handy. How many of you use VPCLI? Put your hand up. All right. Those who don't do, please learn it. It's really, really 
really convenient, especially if you work with lots of WordPress sites. So VPCLI has these built-in tools that you can verify that, the, that your WordPress core files haven't been modified. It would compare the checksums of the original WordPress release and the release you have installed. And there's also, a, you can also do it for plugins and teams. But this, of course, is, works only for plugins that are in the WordPress.org directory. If there are like custom plugins, then there's nothing to compare against. Or if there are paid plugins that are not accessible publicly, then VPCLI can't compare them. Then we also have one custom VPCLI package, which we use. It's, it does the same thing, but it also can show you the diffs. So if, the, if it detects that the file has been changed, it will show you what is the difference between the plugin files of this version on your system and then the plugin files of the same release in WordPress.org. So in this case, we found actually several plugins that had code modified. It didn't, the plugins didn't match the versions that are released on WordPress.org. But unfortunately, WordPress.org, the current subversion system they use and the tagging system they use doesn't enforce that one single release version would be exactly the same. The plugin developer can make changes, for example, to the readme file. So it depends on at what time you install that plugin, which version you will get. So there's some false positives that this technique can yield. And in this case, we used the diffing tool to see what was the changes and, and, and came to the conclusion that this was false alerts. This was not related to the security incident. Right. And we went through all kinds of things, and it takes some time. And even if we had three people working on four sites in parallel, it took some time. And remember that the sites were shut down temporarily, all of this during this entire investigation. Right. And then the next step we do is to check the WordPress user list if there are any recently added users or some usernames or email addresses that don't look valid. And then we also check the database itself if there are any recent posts or something, recent changes injected into the database. And this is the SQL. This is one example of the SQL queries you can do. And by the way, I will be posting my slides on Twitter after the talk, so you will get, you can copy paste all of these commands later. So using, at this step, we noticed something fishy. That there was on multiple on many of the investigated sites, there was this variation of Trollherten in the user database and some foreign addresses which our customers surely don't use. So this was an anomaly. anomaly. And since these have the dates when the users have, been re have registered, then this was kind of bingo for us, because this then opened, opened up, gave us lots of data to find more clues about what had happened. So we knew that somebody had managed to get additional ac user accounts registered on WordPress, and we knew what email addresses they had been using, and we knew the timestamp when it happened. So based on the timestamp, we could then look in the logs, what happened around that time, before it and slightly after it. Then we found the IP addresses, and with the IP address we could find more what the same attacker had done. And just those are things you can do with basic grep from logs, assuming that you have access to, to all of the access logs of your server. So, with this clue we found out in the logs, 
when this what happened. And this is how the entry looks like. Looked from from an access point log, from an access log. Can the people in the back of the room see the too small? Yeah, you can see, great. So we saw this pattern. Do you can you based on looking at this request understand what's happening? So there are some post requests to the VP admin and they return return 200 OK as the result, which means that those posts were accepted and they didn't fail. So they did something that they shouldn't be able to do from the outside. And then quickly after that, somebody registered an account and then verified that account because when you register an account, you get an email which you need to click on to verify that before WordPress activates your account. And after that, they continued doing something, sending some requests to WordPress, which were successful. And that was the IP address. It was a Russian IP, but you can't really make any conclusions of, of, of this. It can be from anywhere in the world. It just happened to be that there was a, the last hop was in Russia, so there was probably some Windows XP machine or something that hasn't been updated for years and was used by others to attack. And we also knew the user agent of those requests, but that doesn't mean anything either. It can be spoofed to be anything. And if you look how quickly this happened in just a few seconds, all of this, then you can know that this was completely automated. Right, so what was those weird post requests to the WordPress admin? So we don't log post requests for obvious reasons. It would be a huge amount of data and it would violate privacy. So, so we, don't we don't log post contents and hopefully nobody else logs posts, post contents, at least not hosting providers. But luckily we have lots of other logs, PHP logs and database logs and others. So we found some anomalies around this time. And for example, there was lots of requests to a table in the database with this name. And that looked weird. So when you, when you investigate a case, you find lots of weird things. And the method is that you check all these weird things and then try to eliminate if this was actually normal after all or not. And this looked weird. So we then grabbed from the files what plugin is talking to this table in the database. And then we found it that it was about this VP GDPR compliance plugin. It was doing something, but we didn't know which line of code it was and what, what and more. At this time, it was slightly past two, and the sites had been down for two and a half hours almost. So, then we started looking into this plugin. Is there something weird with this plugin? And we looked at its change log, and since it's open source and on WordPress.org, we could go e exactly look at what lines of code was changed in the recent release. And then we found that they've done if you know what SQL injections are, then you, if, if you see developers adding uh, these signs around what they're passing to SQL, then you know it's probably something they've been fixing. They've probably been fixing SQL injection stuff. So at that point, we were pretty sure that it's related to this plugin, and our first solution was to just remove that plugin. It's kind of ironic that the customer had this GDPR plugin to improve security, and then it was the point of entry for an attacker. And then very quickly after that, it was the afternoon in Finland, so US woke up, and people in the US started blogging and posting news, and then we found out that other people had found 
similar attacks and posting about it. And here are some links. And as I said, I will post my presentation on Twitter afterwards, so you can go and read, read on these articles to see more details about what happened. Sukuri has a very good blog post on this specific vulnerability in this plugin. Yeah, so what was it? So it, it was an SQL injection thing, so that it was possible to edit WordPress options, inject WordPress op options without any authentication. So what the attacker did with those post requests, that first they changed the settings in WordPress that anybody can register, and then they changed the settings that the default role when you register new users is administrator. So, and then after that, they registered a new account, which had administrator privileges, and after that, they could access the site and do more. And this, is, this was reported by Adrian Mershen. So credits, credits goes to him for figuring this out. And this was fixed in GDPR compliance version 143. So when we figured this out, we knew that this affects everybody running this plugin. So we, we in, in addition to the normal tested updates we do, we also do security updates, and we decided this is something that we need to update for all of our customers immediately, and we entered this into our automation and started rolling updates for everybody to ensure that nobody else would get breached. And then it was almost 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So this was the investigation part. Then we started thinking, what do we, what, which steps do we need to take before we can reopen the sites again? So what you want to do is you want to ensure that whatever was the entry point is closed and removed, so nobody can re-enter. And then you want to make sure there are no planted code or backdoors that could be used to access it. So obviously we removed those user accounts which were not authorized. And then we, our rule is that we try to recover backups and get back to those, because that's the only way you can be sure the site is clean. But in this case, it was a site with lots of traffic and lots of changes, and going back to an old backup was not an option. So we used our security scanners to find if there are any suspicious PHP calls, which are usually typically used in backdoors, figure out. And luckily, luckily we didn't find any malware, or actually we did find one, one file, but not more than that. And then also, in addition to removing these fake accounts, we also, as a precaution, changed everybody's passwords, and we have an automated tool for that, which also our customers can do if they think that they want to change all of the passwords at once for all users. And here is a screenshot from our, our custom tool. So we scan for patterns of malicious code all the time from our customers. And then we analyze. When we have findings, then we need to analyze if it's a false positive, or is it actually malware, or is it just like bad practice, malpractice that somebody wrote the plugin and did something stupid, but it's not intentionally a backdoor. And then, finally, after several hours of work, intense work, we were able to open the sites again and notify our customer that, that they are public again, and sites are clean and reopened. And once the sites have been reopened, you naturally need to continue to monitor it closely to see if the there are new attack attempts, or if there are calls, if there was some backdoor that you didn't detect, and some, there's some suspicious traffic going on. And during the investigation, of course, we, since it took so long, unusually long, we sent lots of status updates to the customer, telling them how we're progressing and what's the state. We sent eight emails all in all, and then afterwards a longer report about what had happened. 
Also, we found out afterwards that the customer did actually get the notification emails from these fake user accounts, but they just didn't realize something fishy was going on, and you can't really blame, blame the customer from it because there's you know, lots of emails anyway, and then there's just a new registration email and nothing indicating that, that it's an alarm or something. And our biggest fear was that it was a targeted attack because the same customer's site all went down at the same time. But luckily, it was just a coincidence that they were using the same plugin on all of their sites and, and they were all, all targeted during the same days. Yeah. So, be prepared. So, most of the advice online when you Google about WordPress security is about how to protect your site. But you also need to keep in mind that despite all possible protections, someday there are zero-day vulnerabilities that will get out and, and bad actors are going to start bombarding the net to find sites that have those vulnerabilities and someday somebody might end breach the site anyway. So you need to have some kind of plan what steps you're going to do if that happens. So here's our steps, what we did in practice. I hope you learned, got some ideas, and I hope you all think what's your strategy. What will you do when you get, if, if you get the bad news? And if you do lots of WordPress sites, Eventually, one day, you will get some bad news, and you need to react. Thank you. Thank you, Otto. So I think we have a couple of minutes. And this minutes. is my Twitter handle, so keep an eye on it for the slides. For some questions. So I think Janne has a mic. And uh, so raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, thanks. A uh, question uh, slightly related to pro uh, this plugin or GDPR plugin. Uh, if the site has been hacked, uh, there is a question if personal data had been uh, leaked and if uh, data protection agency needs to be notified about that. Have you ever with uh, WordPress done also this kind of uh, forensics to decide or maybe was it, was, was it important with these sites to, to dis decide if something has also been taken off the site? Yeah, so in, in this case, we knew that the intruder got administrator access, so they could download everything if they want. But we didn't find in the logs any signs that would, they would have downloaded everything. And also, the, the attack which they did, that they, tried, they changed the site URL to redirect all the traffic somewhere else, that was kind of their motivation, and it didn't work very well because that site they redirected to didn't work anymore, probably it got too much traffic. So in this case we concluded that there was not, not any significant risk that all of the user data could have leaked. But in, in other cases, this is something you need to consider in Europe, that you need to notify the data protection agency about this. And, and first and foremost you need to notify the customer as quickly as possible. I think we had another question over there. Yes. Uh, my question is um, a little bit more on the human side. Uh, communicating this to a customer is always uh, difficult. So uh, did you communicate? It was the technical team who communicated with the customer, first of all. And then was the customer reaction uh, that of uh, alarm and uh, and kind of made your work a little bit more difficult, or was a comprehension and yes. So we have we have already made templates about what what kind of notifications we tell the customer. So this is the part of the preparation you should do. That in addition to having backups and everything you can do in advance, mm -hmm. and then knowing some tools how to investigate and clean up, you should also include in your process that what kind of email templates you have and what, what you are notifying and where. So we have a 
we, we have a good text to send to the customer so that they immediately know what's going on, but they don't get too much freaked <laughs> and don't do anything stupid. And in this case, everything worked very well. The customer quickly replied that they got the email and they started to do their own investigations on their own side and checking through the... They, of course, they didn't have access to the site during the time it was shut down. But then afterwards, when we reopened it, we asked the customer to please log in and check, continue and check if there's some anomalies. Because of course, the customer knows the site more deeply than we do, so they can detect if there's some, something more unusual on the site. And, and yeah, we sent out eight emails to the customer during this, this process. So the communication is a very important part of this. Thanks. Other questions? I had one maybe thing I, that I, you could iterate. I also on. have a question to the audience. <laughs> How many of you have been involved that your site got hacked? Ouch. <laughs> well, you came to the right talk. <laughs> we have another question over here. Uh, hi Otto, and thanks for the talk. Uh, in general, what do you think that how big a part of these hacks uh, are related to plugins? Yeah, so that's in my Security 101 talk. I recommend you go and check it out on WordPress.tv. So WordPress core is pretty secure, at least for recent years, and all of the security issues are related to teams and and most of all plugins. And the sad thing is that if you look at vpvuln.com, which lists these known security vulnerabilities, and in my Security 101 talk, I usually show this slide with statistics of which plugins have most security issues. Then in the top 10, there is iTeam security and WordFence. So it's kind of ironic that most security issues are in plugins. And then when people install plugins, to mitigate security issues, they actually get more security issues, or c can get more. But yes, plugins are the, is the problem. Any other questions? Great questions, by the way. I had one thing about uh, the checksum that you were uh, showing, uh, how the different uh, versions, etc. Yeah. Could you just go through that again, like uh, how you know updating a README and how the vpcli command can fail? Yeah, so, so the thing with the wordpress.org plugin directory is that when you submit a new plugin, to get it in, it needs to pass review. But once it's in, you can update it as many times you want, and there's no review anymore after that. And luckily, there's a project called VP Tide. Coming, coming to core so that there will be more automatic quality control in the WordPress plugin directory. But currently the WordPress plugin directory is not very supportive in quality things. And this thing I was talking about is that when you publish a new version of a plugin, let's say 1.5, then you change the, the version string in the, in the main plugin PHP file and push that to wordpress.org repositories and after that people will see that they have an update and they start updating that. But you can also make other changes to the plugin and push that without changing the version number. So there can exist in the repository like slightly different versions of the plugin but they still have the exact same version number and this makes it hard to verify that if you have version 1.5 installed on your system, to verify in a completely automated fashion if it's still intact and not modified in any way, because it can be modified, it can have different versions. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Then I'll think we end there with a big applaud for Otto.